And I've done a, a survey of my own, um, non-scientific, and, and realized that uh, I'm a better driver than most of the drivers I see using the roundabouts on University <laughs> Avenue. But then I read about a professor of psychology, David Meyer. He says that most drivers, even those who've been hospitalized after a car accident that they were a part of, believe themselves to be safer and more skilled than the average driver. There they are in the hospital bed, perhaps having caused the accident, and they still think they're better than the average driver. The one thing that unites all human beings, regardless of age, gender, religion, economic status, or ethnic background, noted humorist Dave Barry says, is that deep down inside, we all believe that we are above average drivers. And I'm one of them. I'm, I'm sure I'm better when I drive down University Avenue. I'm better than the average drivers I encounter on those roundabouts. This morning in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus puts folks with self-righteous behavior in their place, including myself. He tells a story of self-righteous folk like us by telling a story about two people at prayer. Now, it's not surprising to find a story about prayer in the Gospel of Luke. This could be the prayer gospel, if, uh, if that's one way to describe uh, Luke's gospel. I think that's an appropriate way. It is prayer that is predominant within the Gospel of Luke, one of my favorite gospels. This gospel is the gospel where Jesus' disciples ask him one question, teach us to pray. And Jesus offers them what we use as the Lord's Prayer. This is the gospel where Jesus tells us that we should always pray, always pray and not lose heart. So comes a story about prayer in the prayer gospel of Luke. You know, when you look at it, um, we've been at it for 36 minutes now, and uh, I think we've been doing a lot of prayer. If you know what we've been up to, um, up to this point, it's been about prayer. Either we've been... Uh, listening to a message in music, and that has made things more prayerful for, for us and, and given us a kind of an atmosphere of prayer to, to have happen, or we've been in prayer and sharing joys and concerns and been in prayer um, with our, our very uh, worship today. The story begins, two people went to a church to pray. Well, it doesn't say church, but it, it says they went to the temple. A Pharisee and a tax collector the Pharisee is a good Bible-believing, church-going, moral person. The other is a tax collector who's despised. He's a collaborator with, uh, with the oppressive government, a sinner in the eyes of most. Now, you know, tax collectors bring to mind for us IRS kind of people. Um, this is not IRS kind of agents. These folks make their money by adding money to the tax. So they'd come to you and they'd tell you what your tax was, but what they did was they added a little bit for themselves, right? That's how they made a little extra money. So this is why they got the status of being a sinner in the day of Jesus. Not really the most lovable people in the eyes of many. The fact is on any Sunday in any church, one can find these two types of people in prayer. Fact is, we all have a bit of the Pharisee in us and a bit of the tax collector, too. And some Sundays, coming to prayer, we feel as good as the Pharisee does in our story, and other Sundays, we feel as small as the tax collector in our story. Listen to the Gospel of Luke and this parable taught by Jesus in chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, 
be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Thanks be to Christ for this reading of the Gospel of Luke. Some days, everything goes right. Have you had one of those days recently? I hope you've had one of those days recently where everything just clicks. Some days, everything goes wrong. Some days, it's good morning, God. Other days, it's good God, it's morning. This is where we live, right in between those two extremes, right? It's either going to be a good morning kind of experience or good God, it's morning kind of experience. Every now and then you wake up to sunshine and blue skies. Your favorite shirt is clean. Everybody at work loves your ideas. You finish early from work. You, f- you discover you got a $20 bill folded in the you know, a corner of your pocket that you did not realize was still there. You got $20 you didn't know about. Dinner is a culinary masterpiece, and your kids actually ask for your opinion. I mean, actually. They actually want to know what you think about something they're facing. You go to bed after such a day convinced that you're truly blessed. You're fine. You're an upstanding human being worthy of praise. On the other hand, On the other hand, there are days you wake up in the morning in dread and a day of disaster. You spill coffee on your favorite shirt. The car refuses to start. When you finally arrive at work, all your coworkers are questioning the ideas that you've had the day before. The bank calls complaining that you've overdrawn again. You're so late getting home that dinner comes out of a box and it's cold. At home, everyone's fighting with everyone else, and the cat's gone missing. You go to bed after these days, convinced that you're truly cursed. You're a wretched, worthless human being, fit for only the trash heap. We live in those extremes, those moments of life when things are just going well, and other times when not so much. Recently, after a devastating loss uh, um, in football, the university... Northern Iowa Panthers didn't do so well against against, uh, North Dakota State. Coach Farley told his team, who were feeling pretty down, I mean, this was like a couple days after the great loss. I don't know what it was, 42-10, something like that, a couple weeks ago. And he said to the team, who was feeling pretty bad about themselves, he said, it's never as bad as you think it is. And it's never as good as you think it is either. Of course, nearly all days of our lives fall somewhere in between these two extremes, but we try to put on a good face for others, don't we? No matter what we're experiencing, we try to put on a good face. Pastor Mike Cope tells the story of the time when he invited a a young college student and the girl he was dating to come over to their house uh, after worship to to have a meal with he and his wife. And as they started to relax, uh, Pastor Mike said, well, why don't you take off your coat and make yourself comfortable to the young man? He'd, he'd already taken off his tie and coat and was just trying to get him to, to kind of loosen up as well. The young man, he was, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure I want uh, to do that. And, and after a little bit, uh, he pulled Pastor Mike aside and he, uh, he re- was uh, reminding Pastor Mike of his bachelor days when he said to him, the only parts of my shirt that are ironed are the ones you can see right now. So I'm not taking off my coat. He, uh, if he would have taken off his coat, it would have looked like a weed eater had gotten a hold of his shirt. I've done that. I know that, uh, that time in life when, uh, when you do such a thing. But that's the way of the Pharisee as well. And often for us too, the part that people can see looks great but a weed eater appears to have done the ironing on the inside for us sometimes. The truth is, we are both Pharisee and tax collector. Martin Luther put it this way, we are both saint and sinner together. We're a mixture of the two. We depend upon God's grace, God's forgiveness. We owe God our best efforts and our undivided loyalty. 
When you focus on the grace of God, on the mercy of God, you get God. But when you focus only on yourself, you get only yourself. So there are mistakes that we make that kind of uh, need to be altered uh, at times. The mistakes we make sometimes, without even knowing it, we make these mistakes. And I think it's, it's time for us to do some, some searching, some self-examination as we encounter our parable, our, our story this morning, confess our hidden faults and say to God, my bad, it's, it's on me in this moment. One mistake that can really come back to haunt us is the mistake or a failure to see the image of God in the people around us. I was at the University of Iowa hospitals one day, and I noted the reaction a man received when stepping onto the elevator. There were already five of us on the elevator. If you've ever been to, you know, university hospital uh, elevators, they're not that big, so we're already kind of not a lot of room. He was not all that clean, and there was a smell that surrounded him. And I noticed we all stepped to one side, almost, you know, like in avoidance. I know we were making room for him, but I know we didn't need to move that much as a collective group. Some differences repel you, and you step back. Just like the Pharisee in our story this morning moved away from the crowd, not wanting to associate with unclean people, with those who were considered sinners. But these differences are all superficial, and most don't reflect the true nature of a person. The really deep truth about a group of strangers in an elevator is that each and every one of them is a child of God a beloved child of God, created in the image and the likeness of God. And that's what we ought to be looking at for. Another mistake is to judge others more harshly than we judge ourselves. Think of the the times that you felt your temperature rise as you were in line probably has happened recently, right? Where you're in line at the post office, that's where it often happens to me, or most recently at High V, uh, when the line is moving in glacial pace, uh, I'm trying to figure out why are we moving so slowly to get my food checked out of this cart. I just don't understand why this is taking so much time. I was just going to, you know, over the lunch hour, get a few things and, and uh, help out the cause. And the clerk messes up your transaction, and you just, you know, you want to lash out. You want to say, have you been paying it? Can you get this right? Is this not, I mean, this is all you're doing today, right? Why can't you get this right? You're quick to judge others. I'm quick to judge others in those moments, but slow to judge ourselves. In our daily work, we go easy on ourselves because we know how hard it has been for us. We've been ill or we've been tired, we've had a bad day, we've been distracted by personal problems, but we don't offer that same grace to others often. Like the Pharisee in the parable, we see sins in the thieves and the rogues and the adulterers, but not in ourselves. And this leads others to see judgments and hypocrisy in us, which does not always land far from the truth about you and I. Sometimes we are harsher on others than ourselves. Finally, I think we miss the mark, as is missed the mark in this particular story, when we are not honest with God or honest with ourselves about our need for forgiveness. The tax collector saw himself clearly, is authentic in his presentation of himself. He confessed his sinfulness, saying, God, Be merciful to me, a sinner. All of this begs the question, how? How do I get to a place where I see the image of God in others? How do I get to the place of showing mercy instead of judgment? How do I recognize my own need for forgiveness? Well, we could suggest on the basis of this morning's gospel story and on last Sunday's message that John Cooper gave, we could say that the answer lies in prayer. 
Last Sunday, John Cooper did an excellent job of discussing prayer and made me think about, uh, about things from, from a perspective that, that he offered. And at one point, I was taking notes. I do that when I'm you know, listening to a sermon. I'll take notes. And he said at one point, prayer is a relationship. Prayer is a relationship that we have with God. It's our way of communicating. It's our relationship with God. And John suggested God has an iPhone, which since I have an iPhone, seemed like a perfectly good analogy. And he says that God's iPhone is always on the read acceptance mode when it comes to text, text messages. It always reports, I've read your message, which I don't actually put that setting, just like John. I don't actually want people to know if I've read it or not, because it gives me some time to reply, right? But God is always right there saying, I got your message. I have heard what you have to offer. Today I'm struck by the prayer of the tax collector. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Friends, I think that prayer is the essence of a prayer that we should use regularly. A prayer that could guide us in our living and in our loving. My experience of using this prayer came by way of a uh, of a spiritual director that I had over 20 years ago when he suggested to me um, not exactly these words but a similar phrase that comes from the Eastern Orthodox Church and that prayer is Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You can see the influence of today's scripture on that, that prayer. Lord, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. How can you fail to see God in others when you've started your day by praying, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner? Pray that prayer every morning and you'll be less critical of others. You'll look at yourself more honestly and at others with more compassion. And let's face it, this is a prayer that each of us can say because each of us has an ongoing relationship with at least one of the seven deadly sins. Lust, gluttony, greed, and sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. Any of those could be something that we could face and struggle with. Each of us needs to be forgiven from such sins. Whether we acknowledge it or not, just as the Pharisee needed to be cleansed of the sin of pride, even though he didn't recognize his own pride, when he said, God, I thank you, I'm not like other people, and I'm certainly not like this tax collector over here. It's time to get honest. Honest with ourselves, honest with God. We cannot go home justified, restored, made in right relationship with God until we're able to be in relationship with God most fully and are authentic with, with God and ourselves, unless we admit that we need to be forgiven. The opportunity comes to us here, just as it came to the Pharisee and the tax collector in the temple. The opportunity to see our mistakes, confess our hidden faults, and ask for the gift of forgiveness and mercy from God. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The opportunity comes to us through prayer, and prayer is tuning our life to God's Spirit. Prayer is lifting your life and my life toward God. Prayer is getting in tune with the eternal. Prayer is turning off and turning down alien frequencies and tuning in and turning on God's frequencies. Let us, friends, continue to tune our souls to God with our prayers. Would you join with me in prayer? Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on us, sinners. O oh God, for your great love made known to us in Jesus, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We pray that you would help guide us to be more faithful 
Show us the way, the truth, and the life known in Christ. May we be Christ for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.